Well, good afternoon. I hope you all are having fun time at Heavy Metal in Motion. Um, I'm Dave Dundee. I'm the astronomer here at TELUS, and um, this is an event we started about 10 years ago. We've just been having fun bringing big machines to TELUS every year. And uh, speaking of big machines, at uh, 3 o'clock, um, the uh, Erlanger uh, uh, helicopter, life flight helicopter, will be taking off. And at 3.30, um, the um, Black Hawk uh, helicopter will be taken off. And so uh, you could go out back and watch them take off at, at those times. And um, I just wanted to let you know, uh, for safety reasons, uh, we have two exits out of the theater. This exit over of, of this side, which is on your left, um, uh, my right, uh, you can go out those doors, but there's kind of some uh, construction fencing and stuff that you'd have to push your way through. So if, if there's an emergency, I would uh, urge you to go down this, this aisle uh, to go straight out uh, the door. Um, but I mean, you can get out either one. One's just more, a little more difficult. So uh, this afternoon, we have the honor of having uh, Anna Cullen here. Uh, she is uh, one of the heads of uh, called The Ray. It's a nonprofit organization that's doing a lot of, uh, of uh, pioneering in the, in the world of uh, sustainable, smarter uh, technologies for driving. And uh, so there's an 18-mile stretch on I-85 uh, that they've re-engineered. You're about to hear about that. And uh, after the lecture is over, uh, and we've had a couple of questions, uh, if you want to spend more time talking uh, to uh, Anna after the uh, program, she has a table set up out uh, at right near the uh, Patasaurus uh, opposite the theater, and you can spend some time talking to her and uh, hearing more about uh, uh, the project, uh, the Ray. So, without any further ado, oh, by the way, uh, if uh, you uh, have a, a small one that gets restless, uh, you, you might want to take them out into the, uh, into the activities uh, during the lecture. But otherwise, uh, just sit back and relax and enjoy our lecture today. And I present you with our speaker today, Miss Anna Collin. Thank you so much for having me today. So I'm going to talk, but I'm going to try not to talk at you. So we'll do questions and answers at the end. But if you've got a question, I know I forget them if I hang on to them. So please, you know, put up your hand, shout them out, and we'll just go back and forth because there's a lot that I'm going to cover. So we'll, we'll try to make it a little more conversational. So I'm here to talk to you about not only the Ray, but I'm here today because it's Heavy Metal in Motion Day. And Heavy Metal in Motion is about really cool trucks and tanks and helicopters and things that ride on this, the road. It is a pretty boring thing that I bet you don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about. And I used to not spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. It is asphalt or concrete. It cracks, it breaks, we repave it and then it cracks, and then it breaks, and then we repave it. And it's been that way pretty much since the 1960s. We haven't really done much differently. But at the Ray, we're doing things a little bit differently, and it's pretty exciting stuff. So I hope that by the end of this lecture, you think about the roads a little bit differently. So this is what our roads looked like about 100 years ago. So the road actually really isn't that different. The cars do, though. You can see that our advancements in our cars has changed pretty dramatically. This is the 1950s. Our cars, again, advancing dramatically. We've changed, we've advanced, we've got a whole lot more traffic. But our roads, oh, just about the same. They crack, they break, we repave, they crack, they break, they repave. Today, though, we're being forced to adapt. We're being forced to change. Why are we being forced to change? Because our cars, our vehicles are demanding it. They're smart. They're capable of more things than they've ever been capable of before. And we're having to change to meet those new demands. 
And so I'm going to talk today about what the road can do and how it's adapting to the environment that we have today. So I'm going to get back. So I want you to picture this in your mind and kind of hold on to it. And we're going to come back to this. The Ray C. Anderson Memorial Highway, also called the Ray. That is the 18-mile stretch of highway. So we're up here in Cartersville right now. So hop on I-85, drive down to Atlanta, keep on going, hit the airport, keep on going. You will hit LaGrange. You are at the Ray now. The Ray is the 18 miles between LaGrange, Georgia, and the Alabama border. Those 18 miles are a living laboratory that test the innovations and technologies that make driving safer, smarter, and more sustainable. It is the only public living transportation laboratory in the world. It is right here in Georgia. I wish I could actually stand up here and tell you that we are one of many people doing this kinds of technology. I don't want to be the only person doing this kind of work, but I'm pretty proud that this work is happening right here in Georgia. And I hope that you are excited to be a part of this work. So the Ray C. Anderson Memorial Highway, we work on every single facet of what it means to be a sustainable, regenerative highway. Wildlife conservation, changing attitudes, life safety, pollution remediation, resource efficiency. When we started asking ourselves about five years ago what it meant to be a sustainable, regenerative highway, we went, I have no idea. What, what would a sustainable highway mean? Could it be a bunch of wildflowers? Maybe a solar panel for education? The more we dug, the more we discovered, and every day we are discovering more and more components of what it means to be a safe and smart highway. It all starts with this man. This is not what we're talking about today, but I have to take a few minutes to just tell you who this is. We are the Ray C. Anderson Memorial Highway for Ray Anderson. Ray Anderson, if you are somebody who has ever thought about sustainability or who cares about the environment, you should know about Ray Anderson. Ray Anderson is the founder and CEO of Interface Carpet Manufacturing. Interface was founded in the 1970s, right out of LaGrange, Georgia. So he's a homeboy. He, is a wonder he was a wonderful businessman, very successful. He did a lot of good, made a lot of money, and then in 1994, his employees started asking him, Ray, what are you doing for the environment? And Ray said, well, I comply by all the rules and regulations. What do you want from me? And they said, Ray, that's not good enough. So he started reading, he started learning, and he ended up having what he called his spear to the chest moment, where he realized in his own words that he was a convicted plunderer of the earth, that he was destroying the planet and he had to do something about it. This man is a man who makes products. He makes carpet. He has manufacturing plants. How do you have manufacturing plants in 1994 and say, I can't pollute anymore? Ray didn't know either, but he decided he was going to do something about it. That was the day he declared not another drop of oil. It didn't happen that day, but over the next several decades, Ray's company got to work. Today, Interface is a net zero company. They are doing tremendous work leading corporate sustainability. We lost Ray in 2011 to cancer, but his legacy, oh, too early, you didn't, teaser. We lost Ray in 2011, not a spoiler, teaser. We lost Ray in 2011 to cancer, and, but when he died, he left all of his money in a family trust with no directions to his daughters. And they went, what do we do with it? So one of the things that his daughters did was they thought, wouldn't it be nice if we just put his name on the highway between his hometown of West Point and Interface's original headquarters? So they did. Turns out it's not that hard to do. So next time you're looking for something nice to do for grandma or grandpa, put their name on a road. So they put his name on the highway, and then when they sat back to admire their work, Harriet, his youngest daughter, said, oh my gosh, I just put daddy's name on a dirty, polluting highway. I can't leave it like that. It's a horrible legacy to leave from my father. So that's where the Ray comes from. We have to be the legacy that is deserving of what Ray did and what he stood for. So just as Ray challenged corporate industrialism to be worthy 
a, be of a, a zero carbon industry, we are trying to do the same for a highway. So now, tires. Why tires? Tires, one tire for every American is thrown off every year. Tire dumps, usually they go into tire dumps, but too many of them go into landfills, illegal landfills, side of the road, you've seen them. You know where they are, especially small communities. There is a lot of tires just lying on the side of the road. They pile up, they're room for mosquitoes, they carry diseases, they, when they catch fire, they burn really hot. It's really difficult for firefighters to put out those fires. Tires are a really big problem. So what we do is we upcycle them. And we upcycle them into a road. So on the Ray, we have actually repaved one mile, four lanes of the Ray with recycled tire asphalt and the entire visitor information center. So the rest stop, so next time you're going northbound, so coming out from Alabama, you pull over to the rest stop, that entire parking lot area is paved with rubberized asphalt. So we have done that by recycling thousands of tires into the road itself. Now what do we get when we do that? Is it the same road? No, it's a better road. 15 to 20 percent longer road, it is quieter, actually reducing the need for sound deterrence. So in some cases, if it were a loud, noisy area, you might not actually even need noise barriers. It actually manages the water better. So if you've got a lot of rain coming down, it actually reduces the splashback, making it safer to drive. This is a road solution that upcycles a waste product and you get a premium road quality. And it's exactly within one percentage point the same cost as a regular road. This is a win-win-win solution. We love recycled tire asphalt. But the road can do more than just upcycle tires. This is the Wattway. This is the only solar road in the United States. It is in Georgia. It is right here on the Ray. It is an overlay. When you come out after this presentation, come out to the table, we have a panel. You can touch it, you can feel it. This is 50 square meters of Wattway Solar Road. In one year, this 50 square meters generated about enough electricity to power the average American home. That's like your driveway powering your house. This is a revolutionary product out of France. And what we are excited about, now, some people are going to tell me, but Anna, 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 it's better if you put solar on your roof, right? Because so, if it's on the road, it's flat. It's not good for the, for the solar. I know. I agree with you. I want solar on all of our roofs. But I also want solar on roads, because why not? Because the road right now is just a surface. It doesn't do anything. If I were to pull up my phone right now, my phone is a phone. It is a calculator, it is a computer, it is an app machine, it makes noises, it does all, I can't even tell you what things my phone does. If I go to my microwave, my microwave is also an oven. I can make pork chops in my microwave. This road that we drive on is just a surface that gets us from one point to the other, and it does nothing else. Why can't our road also multitask? When it's not a safe surface to get us from point A to point B, our road should be multitasking and generating clean, renewable energy. So that's what the race set out to see if it would work. So in 2016, December 2016, we piloted the very first Wattway outside of France. We were really excited about it. In fact, we were so excited about it after piloting it for a few years when we had to repave the visitor center we, and we had to pull it out. If you were to go, don't go to the Ray right now because it's not there because we pulled it up because in two weeks, we are reinstalling version three. This is an upgraded, brand new version that the company is working on and they're ready, about ready to go public with this version. So they've upgraded and improved the product based on the feedback that they've gotten from our first pilot project. And we're really proud of the work that we've been able to do with this project that people can see Every time they go past the visitor center, they can touch it, they can feel it, they can see this brand new technology. You can see up close and you can see it when you go out to look at the, on the table example. It's got this really kind of gritty looking surface, 
This is a recycled glass overlay that makes it actually really skid resistant, so it's a really safe surface to drive on. And it's not just the road surface that can multitask. Picture in your mind, you're driving down the highway. Think about all that land on the side of the road. The Department of Transportation owns all that land, and it's not being used. And there's no reason for it to not be used. There is a certain amount of land that needs to be saved and cleared for emergency use, but not all of it. It's acres and it's acres of land that's just sitting there. We should use that land. We should do something productive with that land. We should, for example, put up a solar array in the intersections. And that's exactly what we're doing on the ray. Construction is currently underway at exit 14 for 2,600 solar panels at the Diamond Interchange to build a solar array. We're the third state to do it, and we're the first state to put pollinator-friendly vegetation underneath. What that means is that we're putting beautiful plants underneath, so instead of gravel or nasty turf grass that you're just going to have to mow all the time, we're not going to have to mow it. We're not going to have to maintain it. So we're not going to have big, heavy machinery clunking into the solar panels and damaging them. And we've got a 35-year habitat for pollinators. We're in rural Georgia. We've got agriculture all around us that depend on pollinators, like bees and butterflies, beetles, birds. They're going to benefit because we're planting those pollinator plants. So this, this is going to be there by December. They'll be fully up and running. It'll go right into the grid. There's no reason why you can't do it. And we think that every state should be doing it because if you think about the highway in the United States, maybe it looks something like this. Imagine if we electrified the entire US highway system. How much solar energy we could generate just by using the existing land we already have, that we already own. We don't have to go and take farmland that's being used for something else. We don't have to compete with cattle or peanut farmers. It's land that's already there that we can use to generate clean, renewable energy. This is our challenge. We're currently working with the University of Texas at Austin to do a study and show each state actually just how much solar energy that they could produce. And we're going to give each the states a web-based tool that they can do and they can play with and they can see how much energy they could make and how much money. And I know this is the boring stuff, so I'm going to just say it real quick because I think it's important even though it's boring. Departments of Transportation need money. Gas tax is going to go down. I know, sorry kids, bear with me. Gas tax is going to go down. So you need new revenue sources. So how do you make more revenue? You come up with new sources like new energy. So those are some things that we think about. We play, with, we, we play in that world. I know that is not the fun stuff. This is the fun stuff looking at this map and imagining driving down the highway and it just being full of beautiful solar arrays full of native pollinator plants. But the money is important. So you remember that video that I showed you where we had the smart cars going back and forth? We're coming back to that. Connected smart cars. Connected smart cars are changing our world. If you haven't seen a smart car, I actually drove here in a Tesla, and I am, if you want to go see it, I am happy to take you outside, and we can go look at the Tesla, because if you haven't seen one, you should see it. Connected smart cars are going to revolutionize the way we drive. They are changing the world, and our roads have to stand up and change with them. So we are doing all kinds of things to show that the roads can play along with the smart cars and support them with the right infrastructure that they need. One of the things that we're doing is connected infrastructure. Now, connected, what does that mean? Connected means that the road has to talk to the cars, and the cars have to talk to a system that is saying, hey, there's been an accident over here, don't go over there. Hey, there's a weather condition over there, don't go over there. Hey, there's a tree that's fallen, don't go over there. All of that has to connect and has to work together. We have piloted a project with Panasonic, big giant company. They have come to Georgia just because of the Ray and our, the way we work with the Georgia Department of Transportation because what we're doing is so innovative. The way we work with the Department of Transportation right here in Georgia, 
nobody is doing these kinds of innovative partnerships. And Panasonic said, okay, let's try something. So we were the second state to get what they're calling their Cirrus project. So what they call it, here's, here's the big new term, V2X. So that's connected car technology. So there's this big cloud data that's actually able, each car that's a connected car, so not my, not my 2016 Prius. My 2016 Prius is dumb, it's not doing, it's not doing a thing. But if you've got a connected car, all new Cadillacs, if anybody in here is driving a new Cadillac, you've got a connected car. And it is sending hundreds of signals every 10 seconds. And that Cadillac is gonna send signals to our road, our receptors on the ray, and it's saying, hi, I'm a Cadillac. I'm green, I'm right here on the ray, here's my latitude, here's my longitude. My windshield wipers are off, I'm driving at this speed, my brakes are okay, and here's about 20 other things you want to know about me. Hi, I'm a Cadillac. I'm green. Here's my, wind, wind, my latitude, my longitude. Here's all these other things you don't want to know about me. My windshield wipers are still off. It's a lot of data. You need something really big that can process all that data and then to find what's important about that data. So if some of you can already tell, I know, I can see it, can tell what's important about that data because what's important about that data is when that Cadillac says, uh-oh, here I am, here's my latitude and my longitude, and I've lost traction, and my windshield wipers are, are on, and my airbags have deployed. That's a problem. So this system now knows that two airbags have gone off, 150 windshield wipers turned on, and they can see that the speed of 130 cars have reduced. What does that say? It says that there's a weather condition, and there's been an accident. They can know within milliseconds that that's happened. They can send help and they can adjust traffic flow. That is powerful. That actually can become predictive. You know, if you ever hear about airplanes, they've got black boxes, if you've heard that term. This system will eventually be able to act like a black box, helping us unpack road crashes and help us piece back together ways that we can make driving safer. Did you know that over almost 40,000 people die every single year on the road? That's amazing. When you go up in an airplane, you completely expect that you will be safe. You don't expect that anything will happen to you. But you, when you get in a car, you know that you may not end up safe wherever you go. And we just think that that's the price you pay. We don't think that that's right. We think that you should be just as safe when you drive as you are when you fly. So that's the power of connected vehicle technology. That's what we're really excited about. Another thing that we're doing is we are doing road, smart road striping. That is a project that we're doing with another big company. I can't tell you yet who it is. So, but stay tuned, sign up for my email list outside, and in a few weeks you'll find out. It's a big company and they are helping us with smart lane striping. And what that is, is that it means that it is redundancy. Smart cars, so that Tesla, that Tesla is looking for the lanes. Smart lane striping has essentially a QR code, and it's saying, I'm a lane, I'm a lane, I'm a lane. Or if it's on a sign, it's saying 35 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour. That it, smart cars need redundancy. We can't just rely on one system. So at the Ray, we are creating infrastructure and an environment so that we can test smart cars in a real world environment at high speed interstate speeds. It's pretty remarkable. If you follow the news, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you're gonna see new, new beds, new, inter, you know, new speeds, and you're gonna see you know, in Florida, they've got a new test bed, and in you know, this place, they've got a new, you will not see testing on a public road. That's what we think is important. Testing on a public road in real world conditions, because that's where you get real world results. And that's what we're looking for, safe public testing. So those are the two of the things that we're doing. The last one I want to talk about is the smart road dot. And I want to end on this one because the Ray, actually, all those other technologies I showed you, we don't own those technologies. The Ray, 
I am not an engineer. I have a degree in political science. I am, do not make things. We do not own technologies. We are a nonprofit organization. We go around the world and we find these technologies and we bring them and we test them on the ray. This, we own. We own all the intellectual property and are developing this technology ourselves. The smart road dot is a technology that allows the road to know itself. So we took a standard reflector road dot, so you can picture them, they're all on the roads. We broke it, and we broke it so that we could add a solar powered LED light with a backup battery and a sensor stack. That sensor stack allows the road to know itself. So it knows weather conditions, and it knows the vehicles around it and what's going on. Now, what's, so you're seeing a few examples of you know, what it does and what it knows. But what's cool about this is that, yes, it is knowing the road and it's able to communicate through sensors and smart things, and it's going to communicate to smart cars. You know, that Tesla is going to get that information. That smart Cadillac I talked about, it's going to get the information. The colors are going to talk to my Prius, my non-smart Prius, your Toyota from 2010 that you're hanging on to because you are a responsible, sustainable-minded person that understands that an old used car is more sustainable than a new car, your old Toyota is going to receive this information because the colors will communicate to you, the driver. We are entering into a period where transportation technology is changing rapidly. It's changing so quickly, nobody can predict if anybody tells you they know how quickly autonomous cars are going to be on the road, they're lying. I'm not going to tell you how quickly we're going to see autonomous cars on the road. I can guess, but nobody knows. We are going to enter in a period where we're going to have semi-autonomous cars, fully autonomous cars, classic cars. We're going to be intermingled on the road for, who knows, it could be decades where we're going to have a bunch of these cars interacting together. We want to make sure that there's equity. We want to make sure that everybody is just as safe. The promise of this technology and what makes us excited about it is that there's the promise that if you drive a car that's not the newest, most connected car, you could be just as safe. You could receive potentially life-saving information. There's fog. Here's your lane line. It's raining. Here's the lane line. There's a car that's swerving. Here's an alert. There's an accident up ahead. Slow down. That kind of information. There's black ice. In Georgia, there's a lot. I mean, in the winter, that's our problem. Black ice. You can receive that information in your old vehicle just as easily from those intuitive colors. And that's something I care a lot about. That was really what I had prepared for you today. We've talked about smart cars and smart roads. We've talked about using rubberized asphalt. We have talked about making solar in the road. We've talked about solar on the side of the road. We've talked about a lot of things today. But I hope that the most important thing you've taken is that the road is not just that boring picture that we started with that a road can be a place for innovation and advancement, and that when you go outside and you see all those awesome, heavy machines, that the road can be just as awesome. So I would love to take a few seconds and answer questions. I know there's some helicopters that are gonna go off in a minute, so I don't wanna stand in the way of the helicopter takeoff, but if you have questions, I would love to answer them here, or we can chat after. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Let's have a big hand for our guest, Anna. <laughs> if you have a question, since we record all our lectures, just raise your hand and I'll rush over with the microphone. And uh, that way we have that all preserved. So I have a question way back here. Having recently relocated from the northern states, I'm really fascinated by your lane technology. How would you adapt that into states that cannot have those physical bumpers in the middle of the road due to snow and ice conditions and needing to plow the roads? 
So there's a, um, actually I have a picture of it um, on the outside in the atrium that we actually designed the technology to fit in a divot. A lot of those lanes and the, um, in the middle are actually now, they're, they're digging them into the ground just because the snow plows do dig them up. And it's designed to be thin enough and small enough so that they fit in with a standard road reflector. So they were actually designed for the northern states because if they don't work for this country, with the states that have snow, then they don't work for anybody. So they were, we didn't design them for Georgia, actually. We designed them for Maine. Other questions? All right. Let's have another big hand for Anna Collins. She'll be outside the theater and be eager to talk to you, and, and you can meet her and ask uh, some more questions. But thank you so much for being here during our heavy metal program. Thank you, Anna. Thank you.